Well, good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, it's an honor for me to stand before all of you distinguished scholars and uh, leaders of theological institutions in Africa. It has been an honor and a privilege for me to be with you and to be able to listen to what you have been presenting. I have before me my teachers, many of them, and so, you know, you kind of shrink when you know that uh, you have to, don't have to embarrass them, but to be able to be equal to the task uh, for which you have been asked uh, to perform. So I do acknowledge the presence of all my superiors, my lecturers, and uh, those that have gone ahead of me, but yet they gave me the privilege of sitting under their feet. And today, I have this challenge of just presenting this paper uh, to answer the request that was made upon me by Dr. Rogers. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, I come in your presence this afternoon in that uh, powerful, holy, and precious name of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom you are well pleased, thanking you most highly for the challenge and opportunity given unto me this afternoon to be able to speak on the question of hermeneutics and to be able to be equal to the task that, Lord, this presentation will be acceptable in your sight. And yet, Lord, it will ignite an interest, even in our schools, to be able to see clearly what it is that we need to embrace as a means of interpreting your word so that we can give it in its right manner and right content and intention to the students that you have given to each one of us as institutions. And so Lord, I pray that your hand will rest upon me and grant me clarity of thought and clarity of speech and stability even under this current pressure. I do ask that, Lord, your presence with me will be manifest. I do ask these things in that precious and wonderful name of Jesus, who is our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I was asked to talk about our hermeneutical center, and uh, it has been quite a challenge uh, to deal with hermeneutics. It is a subject that has not so much uh, been quite uh, in, uh, an interest on my part. Uh, even though it is a very, very important subject for <laughs> theological education, an important subject indeed even for the interpretation of the Bible as we preach it out in our churches, yet I think that I've been thinking of so much of the application aspect of the word to enable our people to come to grips with the meaning of scripture, with how they can live out their Christianity. But now, at the end, when I was asked to do this, uh, I had to delve into it. I said, well, let me go back and look uh, at what I know and how I can refresh my memories and be able to convey the things that I do understand concerning our hermeneutics even as Baptist institutions. I would like, in the beginning, to make a definition uh, that uh, one of the definitions that I have uh, read about, I know in hermeneutics is about biblical interpretation, but let me just look at uh, one that is very common and that one that we all understand. Uh, and I'm referring to the definition that Dana and uh, Glazy made, and uh, they say that uh, hermeneutics is a science which deals with the history, principles, laws, and methods of interpretation. The science which deals with the history, principles, laws, and methods of interpretation. The word hermeneutics is a word that is derived from the Greek 
word hemenuin. You know, it's Greek. Uh, and of course, it means to explain. Uh, Robert M. Grant has also defined the task of interpretation of any written record of human thought as the exposition of its author's meaning in terms of our own thought forms. Exposition of its author's meaning in terms of our own thought forms. And this paper addresses the subject of hermeneutics using the grammatical historical thought. Grammatical historical approach that Baptists have embraced for a long time. According to Abner Cho, he is coming from the Reformed Doctrine Theology, I mean, uh, background. Cho says, the hermeneutic prescribed by, by, by scripture and the hermeneutic that leads to a full exposition of scripture's message uh, that honors Christ and also enables the reader to see what the authors have established. He says this is the presentation of uh, the interpretation in such a way that it enables the reader to see what the authors intended even as they were writing. Now, the presentation emanates from the Baptist denomination's emphasis on the primacy of scripture for faith and practice. We Baptists have been known, and this phrase has been repeated several times, as people of the book. And the major historical and contemporary Baptist confessions affirm this reality. For instance, the statement by the Chicago, uh, sorry, the, the short statement in the Chicago statement on biblical inheritance holds that God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator and Lord, redeemer and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. Again, it says, Holy Scripture, being God's own word, written by men prepared as superintendent by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. Thirdly, this statement says the Holy Spirit, scripture divine author, both authenticates it to, our, to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understand its meaning. Being holy and verbally God-given, scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's uh, acts in creation, about the events of world history, and, and about its own literary origins under God than in its witness to God's serving grace in individual lives. The fifth statement says, the authority of scripture is inescapably impaired. If this thought of divine inerrance is anywhere limited or disregard, disregarded or made relative to a view of truth, which is contrary to the Bible's own, and such lapses being serious, lost both the individual and the church. Likewise, the 2000 Baptist faith and message affirms that the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure or divine instruction, 
It has God for its author, salvation to its end, and truth without any mixture of error for, it, for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. When you look at your own seminary institutions, and I think that one of the things that we observe is that in our articles of faith, we also affirm what uh, the Baptist faith and message has outlined. So we all hold to the same uh, kind of belief. And both statements affirm the primacy and the inerrance of scripture and this value as the fundamental basis upon which Baptist beliefs and practices are to be derived. At this as this paper shall observe, Baptist responses to Pentecostalism have confounded the efficacy of these statements. My aim in this paper is to examine the subject of hermeneutics in the light of some Baptist churches' tendency to compromise their, pro their position regarding the doctrine of the primacy of scripture. As uh, Dr. Rogers has rightly observed in his book, uh, he wrote a book, uh, The Issue of Pentecostal Worshiping or Praying, and this is where I derived that statement. While we have been careful not to allow some of the bad doctrines in other churches to infiltrate our churches, we have not been very careful with some of the practices. This paper also examines the reasons Pentecostalism has been a challenge among Baptists, particularly to, in the African context, and also attempts to identify the real point of departure from the primacy of scripture and the necessity of adhering to proper biblical hermeneutics and return to a Baptist heritage. So in dealing with this paper, I've talked about the Pentecostals in Africa, Baptist vulnerability to Pentecostalism, the Baptist drift toward Pentecostalism and their response, and the importance of hermeneutics in restoring the primacy of scripture. I've realized in the, not in the program that someone must be talking about Pentecostals in Africa. And uh, I thought that maybe I can leave out that one and allow the next speaker to deal with that one. And then I can move on uh, to the Baptist drift toward the Pentecostalization uh, uh, that you know, they have embraced. Baptist responses to Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism. Whereas classical Pentecostalism was viewed with suspicion by most Baptists, near Pentecostalism appears to have caught the attention of many and invited diverse responses among Baptist churches in Africa. The late Dr. Annette suggests that the slow church growth of the 1990s in the Baptist churches, coupled with the mass exodus of members that followed the resurgence of New Pentecostalism, have ignited a spectrum of responses. On the one extreme, the traditionalists hold firmly to the historical Baptist faith and practice, and these maintain a secessionist approach in their view of charismata and resist neo-Pentecostalism influences. Next to them are Baptists who manifest a hidden response to Pentecostalism. They appear at the historical traditional Baptist church and do not um, promote charismatic manifest manifestations as a core element of their corporate life. But they are individual members and attend meetings with ministries where charismatic expressions are visible. 
To a large extent, the church neither restricts nor affirms the practices publicly. I remember in one of our churches, the International Baptist Church of Lusaka, uh, it used to happen that uh, on Sundays, we had prominent individuals, very educated people, university uh, professors who were members of our church. But they subscribed to some of the leanings of Pentecostalism. And as soon as church was over on Sunday, they would jump in their cars, and then they would say, let's go and top up. So I didn't know what they meant. And so all the time they would say, let's go and top up. So eventually, I realized that they were actually going to a Pentecostal apostle who would prophesy, you know, about the things that would affect them, you know. And eventually, he could even match some of the men and women that went to, to see him and would say, you and you, the Lord has told me that you must marry. And uh, some of those marriages never worked. But they went to top up. <laughs> On the other extreme side of this uh, spectrum, there are imitator churches. These are Baptist churches who unconsciously or consciously copy and apply the charismatic manifestations to their corporate life. Baptist churches in rural areas without strong theological educated or theological educated leaders near them have been particularly vulnerable in this regard. Charismatic manifestations among Pentecostals are deemed simply as expressions of a church on fire by Baptists and imitating them in attempting spiritual things. And then we have next to them um, Baptists who have embraced the word faith teachings. And of course we have the 700 club on our TV. And so people tune in to TBN and they like watching uh, uh, Pat Robertson uh, on 700 Club. And so these this word first teachings are embraced uh, by most of our members. And in the center of the spectrum are two other responses. Uh, the restrained Baptists on one hand restrict new Pentecostalism, and these are the common brand of Pentecostal oriented Baptists. These are Baptists who at some time in the past, had embraced near Pentecostalism, but were disappointed with extremism. And so they came out, and they don't want to allow that in their presence. They allow and even support charismatic manifestations, yet suppress any sign of disorder. The converse side of this response is the unrestricted Baptists who openly accept, welcome, and encourage speaking in tongues, prophecy, deliverance, even in their worship services. And this is the most prevalent manifestation of Pentecostalization, Pentecostalization among Baptist churches in Africa and particularly in Zambia. Of course, in the Congo, it's there. They call it a social lift. You know, when they talk about the, uh, the health and wealth, uh, the prosperity gospel. So it's, it's all there. Now, let's look at the Baptist vulnerability to Pentecostalism. Why is it that it has made us vulnerable? The broad spectrum of Baptist affinity toward Pentecostalization is clear evidence that Baptists in Africa were already vulnerable to the Pentecostal charismatic onslaught. In his book, Dr. Annette, again, I refer to him, draws three conclusions from his Togolese research. That can be summarized into three basic problems, foundational, structural, and polity inadequacies. According to him, the mission created vulnerable churches because of its failure to grasp the deep structures of culture, to develop an effective communication strategy, to present the gospel accurately, and to apprentice church leaders appropriately. I'm glad it's him who is saying it, it's not me. 
it's a missionary who is saying it, it's not me. So, but I can also say that we have been in, in, in the ministry for a long time and we too should be blamed. Those of us that have been in the ministry for a long time, we should be blamed for not addressing our own ATR, African traditional religion, as we deal and present the gospel to our own people. So I would not ascribe this to missionaries only, but to all of us as theologians, uh, because we are all responsible. Some of us, we live in Africa, but we don't even know where we belong and what we believe in. We don't even know our traditional background. And so we just present the gospel as if there was no traditional uh, beliefs underneath it. So we too are to blame. Uh, so I exonerate you, brothers, uh, from this statement. You are not the only ones. The mission created vulnerable churches. Um, uh, I, 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 sorry, I'm just repeating that statement. Most respondents to this research, um, I think they, they, they say that uh, the mission did not contextualize the gospel into the African worldview, uh, which is a common thing that we all have understood. We all have talked about the, the flow of the excluded middle, which Paul Hibbert talks about. And it's not only in Africa, it is in India and in some other third world countries. So and I think all of us now have grasped that aspect that there is this base at the bottom that needs to be addressed even as we discuss the issue of hermeneutics and the issue of delivering the message of Christ to our people. So again, that is something that uh, we all need to look at together. So the belief systems, much less the epistemology, categories and logic of the worldview remain unaddressed because of the mission's western influenced possibility structures which did not correlate with those of the African context. Um, and this is called the middle, uh, uh, excluded middle or the middle zone. And I think that now that we are aware of it, we can deal with that one. Then there is a heightened focus on the decisions for Christ and church planting. This overlooked the significant aspects of discipleship and leadership development. I remember I had attended the meeting in 1999 in Zimbabwe. I don't know how many of you are present here attended that meeting. Uh, I think that uh, that's when the CPM began, the church planting movement. And uh, I went to the organizer of the meeting and I said, what about theological education? He says, no, that's not important. What is important is reaching out the lost. That is what is important. Planting churches and sending out missionaries. Theological education is not important. At the end of the day, when I looked closely, I discovered that uh, the organizer was actually had a, a, a rough kind of situation with one of the theological seminaries that the principal of that seminary had behaved not well. And so he was against all seminaries because of the behavior of one of the principals, a, a, an African principal, toward him. And he disregarded all manner of supporting uh, theological education. I said, but Bambo, what, Bambo is the word of so Mr. I said, but what you are saying uh, is not right. I think you need to rethink about the importance. And I'm very happy that we have all been brought together, Dr. Rogers, for, for this. I think I'm so privileged and honored that my desire has been met. You know, it's almost like uh, somebody says, now I can go. Uh, that this thing has happened. Uh, I'm so glad that you are able to think about the importance of theological education again. Now, what is important about hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is crucial and important in restoring the primacy of scripture which we hold on to. It's very, very important. It's very crucial for us. 
And uh, I think that we have listened, we have not put so much emphasis on it. Uh, and two, when I went and looked through, as I was given this task, it was almost like saying to me, you have neglected this part. You have neglected to teach your people this aspect of biblical interpretation. No wonder the people are lost. No wonder the people are assuming anything that comes your way. And so I see that we need to go back to proper biblical interpretation if we are going to restore the primacy of scripture in our Baptist churches. So, so at the core of this Pentecostalization of Baptist churches was the inability among the Baptists to guard the primacy of scripture and apply themselves fully to biblical interpretation or hermeneutics on the one hand and the indifference to challenging the emerging Pentecostal hermeneutics. These responsibilities were emphasized by Apostle Paul to young Timothy. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And then he says to him, grace be with you. First Timothy 6, verse 20 to 21. And I'm reading, I was reading from the ESV. In essence, Paul charged Timothy to guard biblical hermeneutics against onslaughts of anything that appeared as attractive hermeneutics and yet contradicts the faith. Such is what Pentecostal hermeneutics, especially New Pentecostal hermeneutics, is. Hermeneutics as the center of theology. Kostenberger ponders the question, why would we want to take the time and exert the effort to learn to interpret scripture correctly? Then he supplies two primary motivations for the solemn task of hermeneutics. The first motivation, he says, is the search for truth which liberates rather than error which is enslaves, and he quotes John 8, verse uh, 32. Believers are not seeking information from the Bible. They are seeking to encounter truth. So the second motivation is more compelling, that is the love of God, the love of his word, and the love of his people. The love for God ignites a deep longing to know him in his word, and make him known to others as he has revealed himself in the scriptures. Correct hermeneutics is therefore the convergence center for truth and love, two fundamental Christian elements. Again, Kostenberger concludes that correct hermeneutics is based upon the conviction that the word of God is the most precious commodity there is, and every effort must be applied to extract the true gems of God's true truth there, you know, therefrom. This demands a regenerate Christian life, hermeneutical humility, and careful attention to the word of God. The importance of hermeneutics is also found in its necessity. Again, I would like to quote Terry, who elaborates this very well by supplying four necessities of correct hermeneutics. The first is that there are diversities of minds and cultures among men. The difficulty of understanding the writings of people who differ from us in language and nationality. And also the complexity of the Bible written at different times in many parts and modes and using many different forms of literature. And lastly, the priority of hermeneutics is in sustaining other parts of theology, including reviewed theology, practical theology, effective homiletics, and Christian life and holiness. He says these are crucial uh, if we are going to get, you know, hermeneutics is, is important if we are going to uh, meet all these necessities. What about Pentecostal hermeneutics? In a study 
of the Distinctives of Pentecostal Theology at the University of South Africa, M.S. Clark addresses the Pentecostal hermeneutics and identifies three hermeneutic, hermeneutical parameters which they employ. Foremost among them is the open, reader-based approach to the Bible as against the closed approach which the primacy of scripture entails. In this approach, the reader of scripture can identify with the author of a Bible text by virtue of common spiritual experience. The emphasis placed on Old Testament hermeneutics, for example, is in a quest to highlight shared spiritual experiences and as such the possibility of doctrinal founded, sorry, doctrine founded on the Old Testament. The Bible to a Pentecostal interpreter is not used as a primary source book for Christian doctrine. The role of scripture, according to Pentecostal hermeneutics, is to confirm and guide the dynamic of the spirit. Experience takes precedence over authority of scripture, according to supposed theological contrast. The second thing that he mentions is that uh, there is a tension between the doctrine and experience. Uh, so the, the, the tension between doctrine and experience theology is constructed in such a way that it does not contradict valid experience. By implication, a Pentecostal believer's sincere and unique spiritual experience fits into the domain of revealed theology. A revealed truth is not limited to the canon of scripture, but the encounters of spiritual men with the spirit. And theology is subjective and is not objective. Thirdly, Pentecostal hermeneutics results in an experiential theology wherein the true must always work for the good of the believer. The good is evidence in health and wealth. As I said, uh, I heard a term in Congo uh, which talks about the social lift. And uh, in addition to the topping up, the people will go and fill up a church because the pastor it promises them a social lift. And so, and this is the kind of situation that our people like. Uh, they want to, to be somewhere there the health and wealth uh, theology. Therefore, divine intervention is expected in daily life. And any opposition is countered by fervent warfare, by fire. And uh, you know, they, they will pray against anybody and they will say that uh, the fire of God must consume uh, such a person. Beneath this hermeneutic is the literal interpretation of scripture text with a clear historical cultural context, especially the Old Testament. And so in summary, the Pentecostal hermeneutic resonates well with African traditional religion and makes sense to us, Africans. That's the Pentecostalization of the church in Africa has been enhanced by our own beliefs and practices as Africans. So it came at the right time, and they said, oh, this is good. This is what we believe in. And so it was embraced fully. And no wonder you see it spreading like fire, because it identifies the, 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 the interpretation with what the people are looking for, with the, what the people are longing for, the health and wealth uh, things. And we are materialistic as Africans, and we want to get something good out of our religion and out of our worship. And so that's how Pentecostalism has had its inroads in our churches. Let's move on toward the Baptist hermeneutic. The Baptist hermeneutic finds its roots in the Reformation, which offered a shift from the patristic and medieval periods. Most reformers adopted the grammatical historical method that eventually emerged as the leading approach to biblical interpretation. The allegorical and accumulated ecclesiastical tradition, which is the Catholic hermeneutic, 
approaches fail, and the grammatical historical approach set fresh hermeneutic boundaries. The Baptist hermeneutic evolves around the grammatical historic approach, but takes exception to the radical reader response approach advocated by the Pentecostals. As Johnson contends, the Bible teaches and the history of hermeneutics confirms that sin's noetic effects are such that human interpreters cannot be trusted to submit our thinking to the meaning that scripture conveys apart from a norm outside our own experience and perspective to which we are held accountable. This truth by Johnson first demolishes the foundation of the subjective reader response approach advocated by Pentecostalism. And secondly, it incurs correct hermeneutics on an objective pedestal. The hermeneutical principles that the grammatical historic approach include um, the principle of faith, the Christological principle, the principle of intended meaning, and the principle of grammatical analysis. Then the, princip the principle of history, or the historical principle, and the principle of criticism. The theological principle, and lastly, the principle of progressive revelation. And these are some of the, the principles that uh, uh, are embraced by the grammatical historical approach. Baptists have oscillated, however, between two uh, basic objective approaches to biblical interpretation, and some Baptists uh, argue that the text is that objective element that conveys meaning. The approach sees the completed text as taking on a life of its own, containing meanings beyond the intent and possibly contrary to the desire of the original composer. According to this approach, knowing the historical context becomes unnecessary. However, this approach fails on the premise that texts are inanimate and have no capacity to construct meaning. The second school of thought that some of the practices that the, the Baptists have embraced in terms of interpretation places the objective value on the author's intent. This approach holds that the author inferred meaning upon the text understood within his cultural uh, context. This approach, therefore, requires a study of the author's historical setting and uh, the text parameters to arrive at meaning. The reader's role, then, is to discover the author's consciously intended purpose and meaning. Among traditional Baptists, this approach assumes a high objective when the doctrine of inspiration is taken into account. The doctrine of inspiration presupposes divine authorship and a higher authorial intent. God's highest passion is his glory. God gets the most glory in the work of redemption, according to 2 Peter 3, verse 9. As Johnson suggests, as Bible interpreters examine the author's intent, in a text, the meaning should interlock with the di diverse texts of diverse genres and ages around the central stream of God's redemptive, restorative, recreative agenda for world history. Now coming to the scope of hermeneutics, the author uh, intent approach to biblical interpretation demands that an interpreter grasps the context, the content, and the concepts being conveyed in a text by the author. Again, I refer to Kosten Berger. He classifies this as the hermeneutic triad of history, literature, and theology, and aversed that getting to the core of meaning requires that the reader applies himself to these three inescapable elements. The study of the historical context of the many uh, Bible historical periods is a priority in hermeneutics. This study unlocks to the Bible reader 
cultural perspectives that may be at variance with the contemporary culture, but serve as the locus for the meaning of the text as the author intended. Therefore, a Bible interpreter must be conversant with the leading sources of biblical history available for each biblical era. The science of archaeology has aided this area of study, as was the case in the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the mid 20th century. Secondly, the Bible interpreter must attend to biblical literature itself with sobriety, sincerity, and depth. The Bible literature is complex, diverse, and of a wider historical expanse than would encompass the evolution of certain terms. The Bible interpreter must commence his literature studies by first coming to it with underpinning affirmation of the completeness and primacy of the canon of scripture. Baptists hold a canon, hold to a canon comprising 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. We see no basis for the inspiration of the apocryphal books as is the practice of some Christian groups. And neither should we ascribe inspiration or worth to the writings of our great Bible scholars such as Charles H. Spurgeon. Beneath the layer of the canon of scripture lies the importance of mastering the general content and the classifications of the Old and New Testament. The 39 books of the Old Testament are classified into four general groupings, the law, historical narrative, wisdom, literature, and prophecy, and the New Testament books are classified under four general categories as well, namely the Gospels, uh, History, which is the Book of Acts, Epistles, and the Apocalypse. Each of these genres possess, possesses a unique interpretive approach that must be understood and respected by the reader. At the core of literature study is the language analysis. This is also called the lexical syntactical analysis. Lexical syntactical analysis is the study of individual words, which we call lexicology, and the way those words are combined, syntax, in order to determine more accurately the author's intended meaning. It is premised on the conclusion that although words may convey a variety of meanings in different contexts, they only have one intended meaning in any given context. Several principles apply in the study of words. Foundationally, the interpreter must identify the general literary form, such as poetry, prose, etc., in which the word occurs. Then trace the author's theme and discover how the passage or text uh, under consideration fits into the larger context. Identify the natural divisions in the text and identify the use of conjunctions within the paragraph and sentences. When the reader is ready, he must then determine what the individual ways in a text mean, understand their grammatical form, and then package the findings into more fluid and easy to read ways that clearly convey the author's intended meaning. After the hard work of discovering the historical context, and carrying out the lexical syntactical analysis, a Bible interpreter must now draw out the author's theology conveyed in the text. Theology or doctrine is not a list of rules, creed, or confessions of faith. Again, as Kosten Berger says, um, he considers doctrine as uh, nuggets that nature and stabilize faith in a believer. Doctrine must derive from the text as intended by the author rather than the reader. This approach to theology derived from the Bible is also called biblical theology and based upon sound exegesis. Biblical theology entails that there will be an Old Testament theology and the New Testament theology. If, as reader stated, redemption is a central theme in the Bible, 
It follows that Old Testament theology promises redemption while New Testament theology fulfills and proclaims redemption. And the two testaments must be broadly considered or understood in that con context. This in turn results, um, results in reading of scripture and consolidating uh, what we call Bible, biblical theology. The Baptist interpreter should be able to defy and challenge any application of scripture emanating from more experiential hermeneutics which is promoted by Pentecostalism. I think this is where I end my presentation. And thank you for the privilege of allowing me to stand before you. So, thank you.